Welcome back to CivilNet. I'm your host, Patrick, and I'm actually delighted uh, and honored to be joined by our guest, uh, Mr. Begor Babazian, who is the Chief Development Officer at TUMO, and we're sitting here in TUMO. Uh, Begor Chan, nice to have you with us. Very happy to be here. Thank you. So we're now on the cusp of actually what's a monumentous uh, event, I would say, as the TUMO is opening up in, uh, in California, uh, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Tell us a little bit about this milestone. Well, uh, TUMO LA is for us a very important milestone in the sense that it's our first kind of foothold in the U.S. It's also in a community that's uh, very much an Armenian community. Uh, it's in North Hollywood at the intersection of multiple communities, one of which is the Armenian. And uh, the process leading up to that has been several years of uh, international expansion. Uh, and uh, we hope that this will accelerate and uh, provide a real global network of TUMO centers, not just in the Western world, where we're very active now, but also in the global south. It's interesting that you mentioned the global network. What, what prompted this idea? I mean, TUMO was already uh, such an impressive feat in Armenia itself, and we're seeing it expand throughout the country. You have TUMO boxes all over the place, and now we're international. What prompted this, deci this decision? Right, so I expanding internationally for us has had uh, major advantages. Uh, the most easy to understand is the financial one. Uh, when we open abroad, uh, even though it's free of charge for everybody, uh, our partners abroad are franchisees and they pay us an annual license fee in order for us to continue developing R&D, etc. And that allows us to become self-sufficient financially in Armenia. Now, already a big part of our operational uh, budget is covered by international revenues from our global franchising. And that is, is set to grow to become probably the, the major uh, source of financing for Armenia expansion. And in Armenia, our ambition obviously is to make TUMO available to every single Armenian uh, teenager, uh, which will require quite a bit of funding and we're on track to achieve that. But it's not just the financial, it's um, expanding internationally has actually improved our content and product and our pedagogy because with such a large audience, there's a lot of scrutiny. Uh, any bugs were immediately fixed that might have been tolerated by the, the Armenian parent, but the German parent is less, less tolerant. Yeah. Uh, but also has expanded the variety of content. Um, and finally, I mean, our mission is to uh, create life-changing learning experiences at a, on a large scale. And the larger scale is the globe, right? So we're very happy that from the, our perch in Armenia, we're able to provide this kind of innovative education to help invent the future of learning globally and not just in Armenia. Uh, I'm a big believer that uh, in order for a child to really become an adult, they have to leave home. And this is kind of what's happening with TUMO, right? To really reach that maturity, really come into its own. You're going international. How do you maintain the Armenian character of the TUMO brand when you're going into places that are so different, like Germany or Switzerland, France, and now, I mean, LA's little Armenia at this point, but yeah. the other ones, how do you keep the Armenian brand going? Well, first of all, all our partners are very aware of that TUMO is Armenian. The students are very aware. And even at the level of the government, there's an awareness and they visited us. Angela Merkel has been here. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, has been here. Uh, and so in that sense, we feel that we are helping not just maintain the Armenian identity, but contribute to it in terms of this image of uh, innovation, intellectual pursuits, free of charge education. Uh, and we're very happy about that. Uh, the natural question that most Armenians will be thinking, right, will be, well, how does this benefit Armenia? You're going internationally, you're spreading, you're helping educate their children. Definitely, there's, there's the help here. What's kind of the trade-off? What, uh, what ends up happening uh, now that you've expanded That's in Armenia question. itself? Yeah, so I mentioned the financial benefit. Um, but in addition to that, uh, the fact is that Armenia is the only location in which there's a nationwide TUMO network, right? So in other places, in large cities of millions of inhabitants, there's a TUMO that caters to a couple of thousand students on a given week. Um, but we're trying to lead the charge in terms of, we had the first TUMO for many years. Now that TUMO centers are available elsewhere, we'll have the first national TUMO network. And as we innovate, innovation is always rolled out in Armenia first. We're working on some AI techniques now. Um, we have already incorporated some, but a lot is, is on the horizon. And we always introduce it first in Armenia and then expand it. And so in that sense, 
Uh, we don't think these are mutually exclusive. We don't think that uh, for Armenia to succeed, others have to lag behind. On the contrary, I think we need to lead the charge. Uh, and it's only benefited us so far, this international expansion. Well, it's such a unique uh, kind of turnaround, right? That a developing country is now exporting education to highly developed countries. But when it comes to the Armenian brand itself, right, in these other countries, I mean, given our geopolitical situation, one of the biggest pains that the Armenian people are collectively feeling is that we're, nobody cares. Do you feel that Tumo is contributing to that mission to put us on the map and to really drive this, this attention towards our small but, but interesting, advancing and, and worth protecting country? I, I hope so. Uh, I hope uh, people aren't just counting on us, that other people are doing other things to make that happen. But at the same time, we tend to be the most optimistic Armenian in the room because we have a front row seat of watching these, this next generation really become unstoppable. And we can tell uh, our next couple of decades are going to be very different from the previous couple of decades. And we've always thought of Armenia as kind of the nerd republic, very cerebral, very much focused on intellectual pursuits, innovation, entrepreneurship in that, in that field. Um, and this has been part of our history. Uh, we adopted ages ago a newfangled uh, religion coming from the East. We were the first like, early adopters on that. We invented a new alphabet and completely ported all our texts to this new alphabet. This tradition, I think, has been in decline in the past decades and centuries, and we're trying to play a small part in reviving that kind of innovation, the spirit of uh, entrepreneurship uh, among this new generation, and they're very eager. They, they have a hunger for that. And I think in that sense, I think our contribution is greater there than in terms of diplomacy. But, but of course, it feels very good to also contribute to TUMO diplomacy, if you will, around the world. Well, it's the soft power of TUMO, right? Um, tell us a little bit, uh, I, I like that you mentioned uh, fostering the entrepreneurial spirit in Armenia. Uh, unfortunately, you, you can feel that in Armenia, in certain circles, there's this kind of anti-intellectualism. There's a big reliance on rumor mongering, or I believe it because my cousin's uncle's nephew was on the border and heard it and so on. Um, and obviously education is the antidote to this. Uh, was this something that you guys have factored in in TUMO? And what are some of the tangible developments that you've seen in Armenia as a result of the years of work you've been doing here? Yeah, we, I do think education is one of the most important pillars of having a healthy society, having a kind of social capital within the country. Uh, but the, the issues that you mentioned around, uh, you know, rumor mongering, etc., they seem to be a global phenomenon. So yeah. I don't think it's just an Armenian phenomenon, but of course we, we want to counteract that with knowledge and literacy and access to um, networks. Uh, and yes, that, that is part of the TUMO mission. In fact, although we're very proud of the technical skills we're teaching kids, uh, our real mission is to give them the kind of skills that will make them very competitive despite how technology changes, right? And so resilience, uh, collaboration, communication skills, uh, creativity, those are the things that we focus on and those are the things that are going to counteract some of the negative tendencies around the world right now. I like that you said that. Tell us a little bit also about um there's current ongoing education reforms within Armenia. Is TUMO cooperating with the government or the education ministry in these? Is, are you offering advice to kind of create a synergy between uh, you and the private sector and, uh, and the, the state institution of education here? Yeah, I think uh, we're in constant dialogue with all the education players, both outside the government, but also the government itself. Um, and I think that our influence is as greatest in kind of setting the bar, setting the example. Uh, we've seen over time a lot of initiatives come up organically that uh, we were hoping would come up. And we, we like to think that we played a small part in kind of creating a challenge for those things to happen. Uh, the fact that there are Armat labs in schools right now is an amazing development. Uh, that's something where we're thinking, okay, now the, if the school systems, if the public schools can provide some of those facilities, maybe we can now move on to things like AI and other things. Uh, and so this process of osmosis uh, happens in both directions, but also I hope happens in terms of two more influencing the public education system, which is at the end of the day, the most important part of the, of the system, not the extracurricular, but we, we try to play our part as much as possible. 
Well, do you find that there's like a language barrier, for example, especially if you're going in the regions, whereas English is not emphasized enough, and if you're going to be in a high-tech world, right, if you're to trip and fall anywhere in the Netherlands, you'll be greeted with perfect English. Right. Right? And for Armenia, if we want to be competitive, uh, the level of English needs to reach a certain state. Have you noticed that when you're interacting with students here, what it's like, if there's a barrier, if it needs to be worked on or improved? Yeah, I think the language skills are very important. English language skills are very important. Um, but, and we actually taught English early on in the, in the TUMO. That was going to be history. my next question. <laughs> but we decided we didn't have to. Kids were picking up English by virtue of interacting with some of the learning material that's online. Our material is in Armenian, uh, also in other languages, but kids in Armenia typically interact in Armenian with our software. But then Photoshop is in English. So we've had people tell us, I learned English from Photoshop, for example. They mean from the interactions with other people, when watching YouTube videos, etc. And so we find that we are contributing to language literacy uh, without actually directly teaching English. And in fact, a, a finding we had recently, there was a major impact assessment of TUMO the past 12 years. Uh, and we realized that kids are actually performing better in school, in math, in English, etc. Despite the fact that we don't teach math, we don't teach English, they are kind of really excelling in these subjects. And we think that this kind of, for us, validates the idea that foundational skills in education are going to have a multiplier effect. And that's where the language uh, contribution comes yeah, in as well. Totally agreed. Uh, let's switch gears here. You mentioned that the next steps is the expansion in the global south. Tell us a little bit about that if you can. What are the plans? Where's, where's the next two going right, to show up? Right. So we have two major leads. One is India uh, in general. Uh, we've been working with uh, multiple players in India. We have an upcoming trip where we're going to meet all the major players. I'm hoping that will lead to uh, a first TUMO, maybe in Mumbai, maybe in Delhi, but then uh, a network of TUMOs. That's all very speculative right now, but I firmly believe it's going to happen. Uh, we have a, a, a TUMO that's going to be coming up in Angola. Those are our first kind of footholds, uh, but our experience shows once we have that foothold, it takes off. Wow. Uh, finally, uh, Begorjan, tell us about your plans in Armenia. What are the next big moves for, for the homeland? So in Armenia, we're expanding at breakneck speed. Uh, we have five or six centers now uh, and about 40 uh, TUMO boxes. Uh, by, and we're going to expand to 110 boxes and 16 major locations. Uh, we have now in Kapan and in, uh, in Ingoh our first, our two new centers. Then we're going to follow that with uh, Yerek Natsor, Van Natsor, and other places. Uh, again, our goal is to make TUMO available without exception to every single Armenian teenager within half an hour, most 40 minutes from their house. My son is two and a half years old. Is it too soon to send him to TUMO or do I need to wait a bit? It's a little soon. People tell us all the time, my, my kid is very smart, very eager, <laughs> wants to get to TUMO. Can, can they come? And I say, of course they can come. You just have to wait a couple of years. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you guys very soon. Thank you.